Okay, thanks everybody for coming. Welcome to our, uh, this is our 49th uh, webinar of, of this series. Uh, we've been doing them every Tuesdays and Thursdays since March and just been having a great time. Lots of great information, learning. Uh, I, I learn a ton. Hopefully we're sharing a lot of different information with different people. Um, this one's going to be just a, a slight bit different, and we're going to do a few of these like this, which uh, which I think everybody is ready for, and from the, from the feedback I get, the... Um, uh, while we're going to talk some technical things, certainly, uh, and and uh, and we're going to have some data up, and we might you know we might jump in and do some things, but we're going to more talk about a bigger picture of using data. And um, and one of the things that um, that I have talked a lot about on here, and certainly in our in our wet in our seminars, and and you know all the different times that I chat with uh, with our users, is data is a fairly you know thick subject you can you can use data in a, in many different ways and and one of the things i always try to uh, impress upon people is is think outside the box a little bit on your data think about it's not just driver performance vehicle performance you know vehicle health and most of us spend a lot of time at least the folks that have been attending these it, it's been a, a lot about the driver performance side and that's what we've talked about about you know with with math channels and how you know how much time are you coasting and and how much time are you on the brakes and and yeah, all these cool things that we've talked about that are they're super valuable uh, but I always like to you know, try to get people to think a little bit outside the box boy if I only knew X right and then uh, and then put sensors towards that and and understand that better it's it's such a it's such a powerful tool uh, outside of just the the normal powerful you know part of it which is that driver performance uh, vehicle performance vehicle health piece so what uh, what we're going to talk a little bit today is is using the data in maybe a slightly different way than some of you uh, than some of you may have some of you may have certainly done some of this but we're going to talk about using aim data for development of a race car and uh, and our co-host today is Tom Long and Tom has been uh, a longtime friend we've certainly ran in the same circles and and uh, huge respect for the man and and his family and what they've done and and uh, so I was chatting with Tom and, uh, and and they they were uh, Tom was the lead driver certainly uh, uh, putting together the, the whole new the newer Mazda Global MX-5 Cup race cars, and uh, and I remember uh, meeting with him and his dad and and some of the folks from Mazda years ago at an SCCA national convention uh, uh, where there was a, a trade show off to the side as well in Charlotte. And they were, uh, they were going around getting vendors for this new program, right? And um, uh, which, which turned into the Mazda Global MX-5 Cup cars. And, uh, and, and they came by and they were looking for a, for a data vendor to, to work with and, and, uh, and they ran it straight up. There, were, there was no, you know, AIM's been in the previous MX-5 Cup cars. Let's, uh, you know, let's just talk to AIM. They were getting, uh, you know, th they made it a competitive effort and uh, and I remember it being so important to me I, I you know obviously I, I'm, a, I'm a, you know deeply in with the aim side and and uh, with a son that came through the uh, the Mazda driver development program as well it was something that was important to me so I, uh, I pushed pretty hard and made sure that they understood that we that certainly I and, and all of aim would be uh, there as much as we could on the on the support side as well and in the end we uh, the, the systems ended up in the cars and we're going to kind of take off at that point with uh, with, with Tom and talk a little bit about in a, in a moment with with Tom about how you know how did that actually get started where did they when they left that building and went off to start the the, the program what uh, how did they work it from a data side and 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 where did it go so that's kind of where we're going to go and and for those of you that are here waiting um, and and understand and note you know Tom's stellar reputation as a driver coach don't worry we're uh, we're going to probably take half and maybe a little bit uh, maybe a little less than that or, or about half of this webinar to have Tom talk to us about his his use of uh, AIM data and, and driver coaching and, ha and and some of his um, you know some of his style and what he does as well. So so I, I know that's important to everybody that's here as well. So we'll uh, we'll make sure we chat with Tom about that as well. So um, let me slide up one slide. Um, here's a little bit about Tom. Yeah, we'll, we'll turn it over. To Tom, give us a couple minute thing on uh, on Tom. But the um, again, Tom, longtime professional racer, coach, development driver. A Mazda Motorsports factory driver, and um, uh, when I first met and, and heard heard of Tom, uh, he was out there racing in his, uh, you know, uh, you know, spec Miatas, and even even a little bit of uh, pre, you know production based racing even ahead of that. So, but what the the one here, the bullet here that I uh, that, that we're going to chat most about is the is the third one, which is it's been the lead development driver on this global MX-5 Cup car since its inception, and interestingly enough, uh, you know, right up until the to, to the present and continuing to do development work. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well.
Tom, let me turn it over to you for you know just a minute or so. You know, just a little bit of a background on you, your website, what you do. Uh, you know, um, and 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 let everybody know a little bit more about you. Yeah, thanks, Roger. Really appreciate you uh, having me today, and excited to uh, to be here on this uh, AIM webinar series. Um, a little bit of the background about me: uh, been very fortunate to have a long time career uh, in motorsports. Uh, feel very lucky to uh, to be able to do that um, for a living um, with. The help of Mazda Motorsports. Um, got started with, uh, as you mentioned, spec Miatas and uh, running with the SCCA for many years uh, at the runoffs and um, kind of moving up through the ranks. But, um, but really, um, the, the latest, most fun parts have been, um, you know, getting to run uh, GT cars with the, the RX-8 for Mazda for, for several years at uh, Rolex 24 and um, moving into their prototype program. Um, and then getting the opportunity to, as we're going to talk about today, develop this uh, latest generation Mazda MX-5 for the uh, Global MX-5 Cup Series. So a um, lot, uh, lot of neat opportunities over the years uh, to be able to do a lot of driving. And through all that, um, I've been doing a lot of coaching and I really enjoy and passionate about the coaching aspect because it's a lot of fun for me to be able to help drivers uh, get better, go faster, help develop their cars for them, um, work with setup changes. Cause um, I don't know, like the team atmosphere is my, my biggest uh, excitement is when, you know, you get to enjoy a, uh, a victory, uh, whether that be actually a race win or just uh, progress and improvement meeting goals. Um, uh, it's a lot more fun to do it together for sure. Very satisfying when you can help you work with people and, and, and see the improvement. And of course you're always improving as well, but uh, improve a team, improve a driver. That, that is uh, that is so satisfying to be able to do that. So I, I do appreciate that. Let's uh, let's start off before we jump into uh, a little bit of information from, from Tom on the development side. Let's uh, let's launch a poll like we do often here. The uh, the, the poll here is the, you know, what aim sports hardware do you own and use? You know, it's a, it, it is a multiple choice. So pick the ones that, um, you know, if you have a, a camera and a, an MXP or something, go ahead and select that. Uh, we, we are limited to 10 slots. So uh, there is a smarty cam slash other is the last one. So if you have other, go ahead and plug in other. And then in the, uh, in the chat box, other equals, you know, whatever it happens to be. Right. So um, uh, appreciate that. These polls, uh, I, I chat with a lot of people that uh, watch these, uh, watch these webinars and enjoy them. And, uh, and, and most people enjoy the polls uh, just as much as everything else. And I try to mix them up and we're gonna do that a little bit today as well. So I, and, and the, the information we get from these polls uh, drives where we go. It, not only emails I get, phone calls I get, but, um, but also um, uh, the poll results help us pick, pick the next topics and, and, and continue on. We, uh, we are scheduled as of right now to go through October and, uh, and continue on. And, uh, and my guess is maybe we'll we'll take a strong look at uh, continuing on in the in the month you know, month following that through the through the winter time. But uh, as of right now, it's just through October. Uh, and as we're kind of finishing up with that, uh, just a just a reminder to everybody, uh, and hopefully hopefully it's been good for you and you've enjoyed it. The um, I have trimmed down the number of emails that everybody should be getting, and uh, you should only be getting one email per webinar, and it's the one that's the one hour before. Uh, I have turned off the uh, the one where you used to get one a day after, uh, and and it's it, it's funny. I got a couple of uh, you know, a number of emails early. You know, boy, you're hit, hitting us with a lot of emails. It's a, it's a bit much, and as soon as I turned them off, I had uh, I had uh, two or three emails, and then two or three people when I was at Laguna over the weekend mentioned to me, boy, I, I like those emails that came. Uh, came afterwards and always let me look at the next subject and, and figure out what I want. So, you know, you, you do, you do the best you can. The, um, let's go ahead and end that polling. I appreciate it again. Thank you very much. And, um, uh, and, and we'll get ready. We're going to do another couple more polls as the, uh, as, as the time goes on here and, and, uh, future webinar topics is one we're going to talk a little bit about today. And, and who do you compare data with because of, you know, Tom and his, and his driver coaching and, and comparing, uh, so we'll probably do the, who do you compare data with uh, topic here and just, uh, when we take a little bit of a break. So, um, so with that, let's, let's go ahead and, um, uh, I'm going to jump up here and just jump straight over to the uh, some data. And while we while we're probably not going to dig into the data a lot, Tom's going to you know tell us uh, you know give us just background and information. If there's something we may want to point out in the data, we may use it. This is Global MX5 uh, Cup data. It's uh, from Portland, a local race to me here here uh, here up in the Pacific Northwest. So there there just some data there, but uh, Tom may or may not use that. So. Um, Tom, go ahead and uh, and and give us an idea of of 
when this whole program started, when uh, you and your in, in your family operation, I know your dad was a you know a big part of it. Obviously, the uh, uh, began that process. You get, you got tired by uh, by Mazda to put those together, and you you selected a data package. Where did it go from there? What what kind of data? You know, what did you put on there? What what were you looking for? Give us a little bit of the background. That'd be interesting for folks to hear. Yeah, certainly. Well, you know, the MX5 Cup platform has been around for a long time and a very, very successful program for Mazda with their with their ladder development. But with this latest car that actually was coming out for 2016, the fourth generation MX5, it was more about trying to find a solution for Mazda in how did we make the car so identically prepared, so identically spec that literally the tolerances were were next to nothing. And so um, that started with, you know, sealing an engine, sealing a transmission, sealing the differential, locking the ECU so no one can mess with that, um, all the way down to spec fluids and, and things like that. So really, really trying to get it as dialed in as possible. And so what we needed to do that was a lot of information on sensors and pressure, pressure sensors and temperature sensors to, to understand um, what we needed to do to develop the package correctly. So, you know, that, that's from, um, from all your standard type of uh, temperatures and pressures you might expect from, from, uh, from vehicle vitals, you know, health, health vitals, but all the way to, uh, you know, uh, transmission pumps, the coolers, the uh, temperatures for that, um, the tra transmission differential, uh, all of that. And, uh, and even things like, uh, like water pressure and understanding what kind of, you know, radiator cap, we'll talk maybe a little bit more about that in a bit, but um, different, different things that we needed in order to really get an idea of what the, what the package needed to be um, as we were developing that. And what was really interesting was as we tried, okay, you know, what, what size cooler do we need on this and what size uh, pump do we need and how much, you know, uh, capacity flow do we need for all these different things. Um, we really started to understand quickly that it was very, very helpful to be able to have all this information um, through the AIM data uh, that we could quickly disseminate, not just driver input, test driver input, but also be able to look at it um, from an engineering side um, and then have it so easily accessible so that way uh, we'll be able to display that for any competitor in the series or using the car just as a um, purchasing the car is for, say for a track day car. So they can have all this information accessible. So that way it's not this uh, voodoo, who knows what's going on with it. They, they have the access to be able to look and see what, what is all truly going on. Yeah, it's interesting that you you uh, the, the, you immediately went on a different uh, direction that that has been done in the past, which is before it was you know it's it's a spec car and 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 we know they're all going to be fairly similar and we use data to 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 develop certain things and make sure things were going to live the right lengths and 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 not overbuild something and not underbuild something and that the cars were strong, but you guys immediately went Mazda, I'm sure with with some direction from Mazda went immediately towards how do we make this the most even playing field that we can make? I, I had not uh, I had not focused on that before. That's a, that, that's an interesting topic, which means that there was a lot of, uh, you know, suspension setup. You know, it, sure, there's the mechanicals in there as well and the, and the coolers and all that stuff. But then you also trying to get at the, a good big balance point, right? You know, that the car was uh, was fairly easy to drive at the limit and it wasn't very peaky on its uh, on its handling and such. So uh, it, it, interesting. I'm, uh, I'm glad to hear that. That was uh, that's that's the different news to me. And Roger, to your point, I mean, it's a, it's a good point because there was a lot of things that we didn't want the necessarily the, the driver to have to worry about. Like, okay, so if the car is going to have a transmission and differential cooler and pump, can we have that so that way the logic is there to turn on at a certain temperature? You know, these things so that way it is one of the the best values in in motorsports. It's really what Mazda pinned it with, right? Make sure this is the best value in racing to be able to have a car like this. And so for it just to just start it up and just go and <laughs> you know, your trans and your diff pumps are going to turn on automatically when they get up to temperature and they're going to self-regulate, things like that. But back to your point about the handling and the suspension, we did go through great lengths to understand really what the, you know, the chassis dynamics were at play, right? So we used the uh, KNC rig to understand what that what that was and in in really understand the chassis flex and twist and we had a great platform to start with i mean mazda built a great car and this is obviously the fourth generation of a, a very very popular sports car and so 
it wasn't hard to make it suitable for racing because it was already most of the way there, but we just needed to put the, the fine touches for the competitors to be able to have the right kind of suspension tuning adjustments uh, with the dampers, the ride heights, the sway bars, um, and then enough, enough stuff going on in the background so that just made it ultra reliable and they can just start it up and go. I remember at the time the um, um, you, you put the, the the shock sensors on the car, and I remember chatting with uh, uh, maybe it was you, maybe it was one of the you know some of the technicians or somebody, but uh, and then taking that data and 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 turning up the sampling rates, so then you could take it to the to to the suspension testing tools that you that you had done and some of the computer and and, and me mechanized and computerized you know testing that you did. So you know full shock pots all the way around the car. I, I remember there was some some uh, load cells in different spots to 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 try to make sure that you, you got everything just as as good as possible. And I remember thinking that, uh, boy, the, the amount of data that was going into this when they could have just taken the car, again, fourth generation, like you said, a very successful car, uh, you know, uh, could have been successful without you know, all this extra work, but boy, all the work and all the data and all the engineering that went into it to, to make it even as, as good as it could possibly be is pretty interesting. You know, and it was so satisfying to be able to see in the first, the first year of the series, we said, okay, well, you know, Hopefully Mazda was, I think their first purchase on, on the cars from the factory in Japan were uh, a batch of uh, 50 cars. It's like, well, hopefully we'll be able to sell, you know, 50 cars in the first year. That would be really, really nice. And sure enough, in literally two months, they had already sold 50, uh, pre-purchased, pre you know, 50. And now we are already having to make another order for another 25 and another 25. Wow. And, you know, here we are at, uh, what is it, four, four years, actually, I guess it'd be t technically coming up on five years and they're over 215 or so built, you know, at this, at this point. So it's, it, it was a really neat project, but very satisfying to see the level of competition um, just as recently as last weekend, you know, having uh, a full field of cars and, you know, here we are on the last lap, a uh, three-way pass for the lead through at Mid-Ohio in, in, you know, turn five in, in madness uh, uh, for the win. So it's, yeah. it's really neat stuff. Heard it was an exciting, uh, pretty exciting race. There's um, uh, a couple of questions. We'll kind of work in a little bit. Uh, Andy's question goes through, you know, how, how, I'll reword it a little bit to to bring it to, you know tidy it up for what we're talking about here. But uh, tires, you, we, we uh, I, I know you had tire temperatures. I know we had tire pressure monitoring stuff. The um, how what did you go through and did you try to find a uh, a way of engineering the car so that the tires lasted the full length, maybe even a, a race or two if if a, if a team wanted to do that. What what was the engineering mindset and the data around the tire tire choice and the tire selection and 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 the tuning. Yeah, a very, very integral and important piece to the puzzle for sure. Uh, we had a great partner with uh, with B of Goodrich that was a longtime uh, series partner for Mazda. So, you know, initially we uh, we started working with them, but we changed it up a little bit. And the, the fourth generation MX-5, you know, this global MX-5 cup car, uh, it's a smaller chassis. It's a smaller overall car, lighter car than the, uh, than the third gen, uh, than the NC. And, and so it really, it required a specific tire smaller in size, right? So not this, the normal 225 width that the, um, that the NC had, but we ended up going with a custom 215 width yeah. tire, but getting into some of the specifics on that and how, how we came about, um, it was very important, as you mentioned, to make the tire last the full length of the race, which they're sprint races, they're 45 minutes, but not have to require you got to put new tires on every single time in order to actually get the maximum performance out of it and especially for our, our track day enthusiasts you know they want to run a set of tires for a couple weekends if possible and that's exactly what we we're able to do with making sure that we got the spring rates and all the dampening rates in a window so that way it wasn't so hard on the tire and what i mean by that is we actually worked with how light we could work on the spring rates and all that to really give the car some compliance made the car easier to drive you could use a lot of the curbing and things like that that the track has to offer but it didn't really make the tire give it that cheese grater you know harsh harsh um, effect so um, it actually increased life of the tire for a long time and um, and uh, reading on that question 
a little bit about the the whole you know testing with new tires all the time. Not necessarily did that. Uh, fresh tires are great, but sometimes they can mask mask some of the handling characteristics of a car. So we always made sure that we worked through a different range of tires. So we might have tires that were new, might have tires that were 50%, and some that were worn out. And just to see what did the car do dynamically that might have been the same or different um, throughout. The testing, so we could so we could get a really good, true understanding of that um, for you know for the competitor. And I know your car. I know I know some of the test cars had, you know, tire temperatures. Or were you, or were you doing it as much? Yeah, yeah, you have the data, but uh, but also driver feel, right? And lap time, obviously. You know, we we've got our our money channels, right? Lap times and speed. So lap times are always critical. But you, you were as a test driver, I'm sure were were uh, it was driver feel. Did it did it uh, did it begin to the understeer side, or did it go to the overall, or, you know, oversteer, or did it just overall lose grip? I'm sure that was a big part of what you were working with as well. It, it was because in, I'll, I remember it clear as day that the specific part about the um, tire temperatures and having the inside, middle, and outside tire temperatures live, I would always flip to that part of the aim dash <laughs> because I thought it was the coolest thing. I mean, when have you ever been able to see live tire temperature on a, on a car? I, it was amazing, and in the in the fact that I mean, even in the Mazda prototype, we didn't even we didn't even have that aspect. We mm -hmm. weren't allowed to run that kind of aspect. So that's, that's having funny. this was really really cool uh, to be able to do that. And what we used that for was it is exactly as you said. Great to have the information after the fact that we could look at it from an engineering standpoint. But when we were trying different spring rates and the split of springs from front to rear and what that looked like with the with the sway bar package and everything. When we started to lose grip, what was the tire temperature doing and could we keep the tire in a specific range and would that help the length of the, the life of the tire? And so from a driver feedback standpoint, from a test driver, I was able to do a better job giving information to the engineers if I could say, hey, when we kept the tire temperature in this range, you know, while pushing the car as hard as we could, keeping the tire temperature in this range it did help the balance over the long run, or it did do this over the over you know a shorter period of time, longer period of time, and it it, it just gave us more information to be able to give good feedback, um, and and kind of help give us the right answer sooner, essentially. Uh, interesting too, though, that the, and uh, when I first started getting into some of the tire temperature things, I was always amazed at how quickly it changes and comes back. That was something that surprised me, and that that had to have helped you as a, as the as the test driver to 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 understand that boy, when I did this, all of a sudden that right front shoots up, right, and, and then and how quickly it comes back down, and then and then when you've got the cambers front and rear, and how the inside is warm, and you could see that almost in real time, especially uh, depending on what track you're on, right? When you you come off a corner and you can look down. And you have a bit of a straightaway you can see the inside stays warm and the outside starts to cool pretty quickly it's a it's an amazing uh, bit of technology it, it kind of cool to how you use the technology to continue on with that the um the, the next question about how many how many test cars did you guys build and and uh, what what basic i think they were evo fives if i remember right maybe they were mxl twos I, I don't remember what the data were but you had a couple cars or did you do all this with one car how did you do that yeah, so we had uh, MXL2 dashes in the car, so still do uh, today with the, mm -hmm. with the current configuration. And uh, we used two cars. So the, 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 the thought process behind that is we had one car initially built um, just as our test mule for actually all the, all the shaker rig type of stuff and understanding that. And then we built based on what we found with, hey, if you put this piece of the, the cage stiffness here versus there, you know, all that played into the, into the, the factor, right? Because it was all a spec kit for the cage and everything as well. Then we built a second car. And what we were able to do with that is um, have opportunities, um, really fun opportunities for not only just understanding, okay, now we're working on handling, now we're working on the cooling package and all of that. Well, what happens if we stick another car in the mix? And we actually, these cars are gonna draft, yeah. aren't they? And so now we need to understand how do, does that work in blocking off the radiator and the oil cooler and all this, and how does that really impact the, uh, the temperatures? And we found a lot of interesting information about that. And, uh, you know, the cars now, uh, they're, they're, they call them as an ND1, which is the original fourth generation car. And now, it, starting in 2019, Mazda came out with a, a higher power, still a two liter higher power, higher revving engine called the ND2. 
And with that ND1 in 2016 through the 2018 season, the cars could stay locked on each other for 45 minutes without having to pull out of the draft or anything because we had the right size radiator, the right size oil, oil cooler, the right amount of flow. Everything was perfect. I could not believe, but you, you literally couldn't tell if it was the first lap of the race or the last lap of the oh. race because they were glued together for the whole race. So. Oh, amazing. That's how those guys like to drive those cars, though, too, on top of it, right? Yeah. A couple of, a couple of questions that have popped up there. Limited slip check. Uh, well, the, yeah, limited slip check. It, it, one of the data channels I've got here is, is uh, it's down here in the, the bottom third. Limited slip check. Yes, it is just, a, um, it is just one of those channels that is, is fun to look at. You can keep your eye on your dip differentials, and it is just the, the left rear, ver you know, one driver driven tire minus the other driven tire and you get a mile per hour difference between the two and now you can look at what you know as, you, as you're coming in and that inside tire maybe is uh, you can see the ABS kicking in and, and slowing it down and you get a negative number and then as you load it and it's then the other side starts to you know driver throttles up and you start to get a little bit of tire spin you can see that and what you're looking for there is if a, if a differential goes bad it either locks up and then the car does you know funny handling stuff or it begins to, to overspin and doesn't do its work to the other side and you and you and you have speed issues there as well so yep limited slip check is just uh, is just that the other one was lamb uh, currently shown on the screen is that a wideband lambda tom or is that a is that an oem one uh, maybe one in the same right well what uh, what do you see there um so again uh, i'm not the engineer on the car so i forgive me i don't want to misspeak on this but if i understand correctly we did use a uh, a different lambda sensor an aftermarket lambda sensor um and it's been it's been several years and since we're out on a new generation i know we definitely use a different lambda sensor than the stock one so to, to um, me this to me this looks like it's a wide band and it's coming from the ecu so it, it was either my guess is it's it's together and it's both. Uh, kind of interesting to see how good the, the the trace is right here at this. And if you look over here, there is a there is another ECU channel that shows a target ECU, and I think it was 0.87. And and the and the darn thing is right there, except for when the you know during the shift points and and off throttles. So uh, always good to look at that. We can do all sorts of cool things to make sure that your lambda is uh, is working well, where we can trigger that and filter that. We've talked about math channels, the the, the power of if, and where we only show the lambda only when the throttle is above you know 90 percent so it cleans off even those uh, off throttle moments and you can really can get a good idea of how you how the car is working so perfect the uh okay the, the, let's take the next step down the road tom wh where did you go uh, you've kind of developed the car a little bit you've you've, you've you've built these cars you've started that uh where, where's the next place you went we started racing them maybe we skip over some of that because the, the the series has just been you know so you know, so successful as usual. Um, what what have you been doing lately with with uh, with, with data and uh, and in the cars? It's it's an ongoing thing, which I find is is super impressive with what you guys are doing and, and what Mazda is is working with. Is they're still they're still doing work, right? Yeah, there's constant evolution and updates with the car, especially when I mentioned that the N ND2 uh, platform came out, which again, it was just a higher revving, higher, um, higher power output engine. Um, we, you know, we needed to make sure for the winter of 2018, we needed to make sure that this was the right current package was the right cooling package and everything moving into uh, into 2019. And sure enough, we had to make some adjustments. So uh, oil temperatures were much higher because of higher revs and we needed to get the car cooler. So we worked on a different package um, with, you know, with the oil, oil and, and water. Um, and even believe it or not, even with the, uh, the transmission, because now the transmission was spinning up um, faster and we had higher transmission temperatures too. So, so a lot of different things going on there. And we found that um, once we made some adjustments, um, we were able to get that all back to where we thought we wanted it and, uh, and moving on. And as the season in 2019 last year got hot over the summer, <laughs> Imagine that the car started getting a little warm when they were in the draft for 45 minutes. So, so they needed to tuck out and get some fresh air. And, you know, with having four years of, of or three years, I guess, at that point of racing where, you know, there was no compromise on temperature. It was 100% nose to tail all the time without needing to even look at the, the water temperature gauge. Um, this was a change. So uh, we've actually just more recently, to your point, Roger, um, been doing some hot weather testing this past summer to uh, come up with some some changes. Uh, we, we used uh, AIM uh, data 
good to, to do a water pressure and figure out, can we use a higher pressure radiator cap that uh, doesn't you know, push the water out of the system into the catch tank? Um, and then you start effectively losing your cooling capacity yeah. over the course of the race, right? Very, very important. And, and I mentioned a lot of this, um, I'm talking specifically with, you know, our findings here, but, but for, for everybody tuned in today, I mean, if you are doing some development on, on your car, if it's not a spec package, you know, there's some really interesting tidbits you can, can play with and use the, the data to really back up and find, you know, what is it that's, that's uh, what you think and what is it that you think that's actually not accurate, right? I mean, a lot of that's what this, this is helping us with. So, um, so it was a lot of fun to be able to kind of come up with some new updates for the car and then put them into the series as uh, what we call, you know, basically a TSB, a tech, tech service bulletin for, for the series. And, uh, and then have the competitors go, go race it. And um, yeah, it's been, it's been really dynamic uh, as, as this has all come about and, um, and how uh, more, more speed changes everything. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, the funny part is, and, and you and I did not chat about this, so I, uh, uh, we'll have to see where it goes, but it, it probably wasn't overheating, overheating to the point of being dangerous, right? But what, but what competitors, race car drivers and teams, you know, they, they begin to quickly see that temperature starts pulling out a little bit of timing when, when it goes above a certain little bit. And they were probably starting to push back at uh, you and Mazda and saying, you know, every time we get, you know, 20, 20 laps into this event, you know, my lap time are dropping down even though we're in the draft and it's because of this this extra 10 or 15 degrees pulling the temperatures and and you know pull, pulling timing and pulling this and pulling that that did was that a drive to this yeah, it certainly was. I mean, the, the fact that uh, you had, you know, temperatures that were that were outside of what everybody noticed as like a normal operating range, we had to make some adjustments to it. And, and we tried all kinds of things, you know, there was even aspects where um, we used like a bigger fan to pull more air through. Mm -hmm. And what in, you know, and obviously, we had the whole, um, the whole talking about duct work, right, having the whole front end sealed right so we have a really nice uh duct into the uh into the oil cooler and the radiator but uh the cars were actually pulling with that with the higher increased airflow from a fan we're just they would pull in more air uh exhaust air hot air that was <laughs> that was not really helping the situation so so it was really fun to be able to you know we had several cars that we would use as a test kind of to test this, um, not on race weekends, right? On a uh, uh, kind of over this, uh, these, these summer, hot summer days um, and be able to really understand that, okay, well, what we thought was, well, we just need more air through a system. Well, that wasn't exactly what we needed. We needed to actually exhaust some of the air to pull it, to pull it through and get it out of there. Um, even trying little things like, hey, we'll turn down the exhaust, you know, give it an elbow yeah. so that way it's not flowing right into the radiator. The and, car right behind, like yeah. That. Yeah. So, yeah, interesting. Interesting oh, that you, that when you get in that draft and you know, yeah, it's one thing when there's just one car in front of you, of course, all the heat is being generated from that car and it's hitting the front of your car, but you get your 10th in row right now, all of a sudden it's stacked up. And I mean, it's probably, you know, uh, it, it's making plastic soft, I suppose, right? By the, by the time it gets back there and now you're pumping in, you know, 300 degree air trying to cool down your uh, cool down your radiators when, when when you're actually heating them up maybe even a little bit and certainly packing hot air into the intake and you know, the, the whole thing that that's interesting uh, i remember uh, years ago i went and helped a, 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 a a NASCAR truck team at Daytona with data and we we were putting temperature sensors and pressure sensors and then doing drafting and 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 to understand exactly where in line where number one the heat from the truck in front and then where it was starting to pack the air into the air box and and uh, uh, just some interesting things to see um, uh, takes you outside of what you might think what it was and then what the data actually shows you and you can consistently see from an engineering standpoint is is interesting it, it certainly is. And, and I would say, you know, like where's the benefit for, for all the, the folks listening and watching in here is, is that, you know, like where, where did we find that there was the big, the big takeaway? It was not only getting the air in, it was exhausting the air correctly out. out of, at, whether it was out of the hood or underneath the car, but also shrouding as best as you can shrouding that radiator and that inlet to make sure that there's no air escaping anywhere. And that, that is, a very very overlooked easy thing to do but it makes such a such a difference as getting the air efficiently through so um 
you know, and, and again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to, to fire them to fire them through the Q and A piece. But um, there's a lot of development in little subtle things that are so simple uh, that can really make a big impact if you're ever trying to get that competitive edge in more of an open class um, that isn't so spec. <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, with a family car and with with Mazda's help, we ran in the uh, in the Mazda MX-5 Cup series, and I remember at the time looking at data. And there was, you know, spec shrouds and, and all and all of that, but they fit they they fit up in there and they weren't they weren't great. And and I remember seeing the timing being pulled and, and trying to understand and you know, what can we do to get this thing cooled down and and being able to go in there and just basically sealing all of those things up where every bit of air that did come in did at least hit the radiator and weren't smart enough to figure out ways of getting, you know, maybe getting rid of the, the hot air, but, uh, but we, we did see the, some of the stuff you're talking about. And, uh, you know, we, we'd go to the point of putting temperature sensors on, on each side of that, right. Uh, the, the water coming back into the radiator versus the water coming out. And is the radiator being as effective as possible part of that air running, rushing over it. So little things like that, all, uh, all, all very, uh, all very interesting things. Hopefully everybody is getting an idea of, yeah, the data is great and it's, and it's beautiful for you to look at your speed traces and all that stuff, but there's so much more you can do with it to fine tune and to prep your car and to, to, to develop your car into the best race car it can be. So, so keep on with that. Anything else you'd like to add on the development side, Tom? And uh, before we kind of run off and, and, uh, and head into, uh, you know, maybe some of your driver coaching ideas about, uh, about data. Sure. Uh, the last thing I would share is that sometimes bigger is not always better in that case. You know, like you would think, hey, oh, just put a bigger radiator and that'll <laughs> fix it. It's not necessarily right. You have to, like you said, you have to look at flow. And even though you have more volume, maybe it's not flowing at the same rate or maybe it's flowing too fast and it's not spending enough time in the radiator to, to actually cool it off or, as an example. So for any of you out there that are really working on, hey, I'm trying to develop this, this piece to, to make it more effective, you got to look at aspects that you're not necessarily thinking about, especially when uh, bigger is not always better, right? And, and back to the point about the question about the tires, same thing. We, you know, if we could fit a bigger tire on the car, would that have been better? And in the way that it fit within the fender well and all this stuff and all that optimization we did, you know, it, we found that that was the best solution going skinnier, bigger. That was where we ended up. So. Maybe the best balance, the best tire life, the you know, all across the board, smart, not just looking for that uh, brand new tire stickiness for qualifying lap or something. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Let's uh, let, let's throw up a poll as we kind of transition into some driver coaching things. Let's let's launch a poll on um, who do you who do you compare data with? You know, it's a multiple choice, so you can kind of you know kind of pick a couple of different ones. But uh, as as uh, you know, maybe Tom will find this a little bit interesting as he uh, as he gets ready to chat about this a little bit. But do you compare data with uh, you know, basically just yourself, which is the, the obvious, obvious value there? Uh, a couple of teammates, you know, friends, uh, an entire run group. Uh, another thing that's getting become very popular is uh, social media groups. We have a lot of folks that watch these uh, webinars and then share their data amongst themselves during race weekends uh, and put it out on social media. There's websites out there. There's, there's folks that have Dropbox clubs where everybody's data goes in there. And if, boy, if you add data, you're more than welcome to, uh, to take data out and compare against. That's a, that's a, a pretty cool thing. Of course, the, uh, the Tom Long answer here, the, you know, pro for a data lap where, where we, uh, where we can bring somebody in, you know, like Tom and, 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 and make a couple of laps in your car and then help you take a look at it. Such a valuable, such a valuable thing. And then, uh, and, and then other ways, if you, if you do something different than that, uh, click on the other and then note it in the chat, that would be great. We'll let that go for just another minute or so. And then we will, uh, uh, we'll, we'll share the results here in just a second. The um, uh, anything you'd start to kind of add, Tom? I'm gonna I'm gonna bring over. I'm gonna use a different user profile here and go to Tom. You know, more from a driver standpoint. What are the What are the channels that you like to see when you when you when you get hired by somebody and you go over and you sit down with them and okay, we're you know let's go do some laps. What when you open the data? What What would you look at first? And we'll, just what channels they are, and then we'll finish up this poll. Sure. Uh, yeah, you know, I think uh, it's probably no surprise, right? Everybody's using the same, the same similar channels, but it's um, obviously going to be your speed trace, and you have it listed as the top, the top uh, priority up there. Um, the speed trace is going to give you the, the biggest amount of information right away, but 
there's obviously everything below it that paints the picture, right? It's like, what, you know, what do you do in order to get that speed trace to, to what it is? And it helps identify and explain some things as, as well. But um, one aspect that um, I also like to have on there is, uh, you know, your, you know, the variance of like what the time's worth, the time, you know, the time gap on that. Because if you do a comparison, right, the time compare, and perfect. And sometimes you'll say, oh, well, you know, this driver is beating me by three miles an hour or, you know, they're braking 50 feet later than me. But you might not even realize if you've got on the throttle a little sooner and carried out of the corner and you look at the variance from before you hit the brake pedal to by the time you get to the next uh, braking zone after the next corner, it could be a wash. And it might not be worth anything. It's not, fo it's not worth focusing on something that, you know, might not be as big of a, a big of a deal visually on the speed trace, but yet, you know, when you look at it, what it's really worth on time. Um, and it could be another thing that maybe you're looking at from a standpoint of, you know, I'm going to use that in my back pocket. You know, I can really charge this corner and know that I can be comp defensive on the way in, but I'd actually won't lose as much on the way out as I thought I did. For instance. Perfect. You know, there, there, there's, there's, there's corners for time and there's corners for speed, right? And, and, and sometimes if, if there's just a short little run afterwards, maybe you do charge that corner a lot more, right? And, and, uh, and it doesn't. There's the, the risk level of and risk from a time, a lap time standpoint, is, is fairly low. Let's share the results of that last poll just so we can uh, everybody to, to be able to see it and take a look. Hopefully everybody's seeing that. I seen one note in the chat that they weren't seeing it, but uh, hopefully everybody else is. Uh, who do you compare data with? Uh, myself is about 50%, right? And then, uh, and, and even if we're doing some of these others, they probably do that one as well. But the number one was, uh, was one or two friends or teammates, you know, at 62%, the uh, folks, folks are, are able to, to have a few friends that they're sharing that are teammates, uh, you know, other folks in their area, in their class that they're sharing data with, that's pretty, uh, pretty interesting. And the third, uh, the number, number three at 11% was a pro for a data lap. They're able to take that data and maybe it's at the track, maybe it's on a virtual session. There's all sorts of folks that have put together programs and, and uh, you know, where on, you know, Monday night or Tuesday, they, they email it over and then the, somebody comes on and helps coach them through, uh, you know, a, a few laps like we're looking at here. Such a, such a great, uh, great time we live in when we can do things like this and get on Zoom and have a, uh, have a quick conversation about, uh, about things like that. So kind of interesting. So that's the, um, that's the sharing results of, uh, of who you compare compare data with that's pr pretty interesting so um the um uh, tom we look at we look at this and there's a you you started down a road there and i and i and i kind of wanted to walk with you a little bit on it as well there are and and get your thoughts as a driver coach the um there, there are times when the you have you have a low speed corner may you know maybe down here or or here you're you're here at the end of a you know in the middle of the straightaway and you can see the time you know time time compare bar changing down here. And we get to the point where, you know, that's about eight hundredths that the driver, uh, the, red, the red driver lost here just because of, a, uh, of something that happened in there. We, we, always, we always follow that process of what happened, where did it happen, why did it happen, right? And, and that time compare really starts off the, 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 those questions with what happened. You know, hey, I lost, I lost eight tenths on this, on this little piece here. The, uh, but what I, what I have found, and I just wanna you know, see what your thoughts are, is boy, you can, you can gain or lose time. Like, you know, this is the, one of the bigger changes. This is one of the bigger changes here. And the biggest changes that I see in the time compare bar are, are often not at the high speed stuff. It's, 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 it's either under braking when you, when you're a, bi a big change or on the low speed stuff where, boy, if I'm 5% different than the, uh, than my better lap or my, my, my pro driver's lap or whatever I'm looking at, that 5% at 40 miles per hour is, is, is it adds up to time and it, you know, 5% at 140 miles an hour is, you know, statistically not as big of a, of a change. So I have always thought that, uh, boy, the first places you go to work where you, for lap time is, 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 the, is the, the last little bit of coming into slow corners, the middle of slow corners and coming out, and especially if it's got a long, a long straightaway. What are your thoughts about where do you focus and where do you start uh, working with, uh, with, with, with a client? 
No, that's a great, it's a great point, Roger, because ultimately you're looking at it from a standpoint of how long are you in that particular sector of a corner or wherever, right? So the longer you're there, the, you know, over the course of, of a lap, lap time, um, the more important it's going to be. And so it's, you're exactly right. It's really deceiving sometimes. Some folks will, um, I don't know, we'll pick a, a, a couple high speed daunting corners, you know, pick your favorite racetrack and really, really focus on that where the risk reward is actually really high. I mean, it's like really dangerous to, yeah. to try to be working on that, where if we pick something with um, not necessarily a later break point, which you could argue is a little bit of a risk reward, but more focusing on the break release and trying to carry a little bit more speed, you know, to the apex or through the apex or get on the throttle a little sooner, things that are more kind of in your control as a driver, um, they net you the biggest gains. And, uh, and I can and I, yeah, I totally agree with you on that. Um, I want to mention um, back to the poll. I think it's worth where something came up in my mind when we were talking about <laughs> that in the poll. And, and I want to mention this because I think it is so neat that you have these these data groups that everybody's sharing their data yep. and being able to use it as a reference. Keep, in, keep something in mind, though, when you're doing this, because like to your point about, you know, you, you see in this data reference um, at that shift point you talked about, about 6,000 uh, feet into the lap, um, how all of a sudden the variance started to change and, you know, that, that was net, you know, that netted you eight tenths. It, it could be things like you'll find when you're sharing data uh, amongst somebody you don't know, but, you know, it's at the same track. Um, Always try to understand that you know the the time of when this happened could could dramatically make a difference on the data. And what I mean by that is, is it is it uh, a cool a cool morning outside in the fall where like you know the best track conditions you can ever imagine, and then your run was uh, the heat of summer, ninety degrees, and three o'clock in the afternoon. That's going to make a difference on the grip level out there, and then also just plain and simple when you're accelerating out of a corner what that means. So, you know, keep in mind, keep data in perspective sometimes that um, you can't beat yourself up too much. <laughs> it's, 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 of it's never easy, right? There's a, a even uh, <laughs> mid afternoon a, a, on a hot track versus first session in the morning when, uh, when, when the air is good and the, and the car may be even making more power. So uh, th thanks for that tip. And, and, and back to, to the time, uh, I mentioned low, low speed corners seem to be where I, I see the added value. You said it in a much more elegant way where you, where somebody, where you spend more time in that area. And, you know, and it, uh, the way you said that uh, made it even more clear to me that, uh, yeah, you're spending more time because you're going slower, but boy, that you, yeah, it's, it's compressed, right? Uh, and on, on when we're looking at it on distance, so that, of course, that would look, make it look that way. If we were to look at this in time, those low speed corners would be pulled out because you're spending more time there. And then of course, going, going faster through that low speed corner would, uh, would, would add up to more, more time gain or loss. So uh, they, uh, I appreciate uh, the, the, the clarification. That's, uh, that's pretty good. The, um, the, um, anything else you see, somebody mentioned, um, uh, Tice, what about the little brake pressure spikes at 400 and 7,200 feet? And what, what he's talking about, I believe is, yeah is right here, you see a little a little spike and I, we could make this a little bit bigger, get, a, get rid of a couple of them. And then here at 7,000, you can see both, uh, we got two laps active, but you can see them there and you and you can see another one right here at 20, 2,200 or so. What do you think the driver is doing there? So Tice has got a razor eye, right? Yeah, to be able yeah, to see does. those little spikes. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, if we were on the racetrack behind this car, we would see the brake lights just blip, blipping yeah. on. So I don't think he's warning the car behind him. He's about to hit the brakes. But what he's probably doing is uh, something that um, I think it's a great, a great uh, habit to get into is he's actually uh, pumping the brake, not so much to like actually activate the brakes, but he's, he's accommodating for what we would call pad knockback. And so what happens is uh, as you run down the road or over a curb, um, the pads, uh, brake pads will actually vibrate back off the rotor a little bit. And when you go to push that brake pedal, that initial push of the brake pedal, it can feel soft. And if you've ever had this experience, um, a little, little tap, literally, and just enough to turn the brake lights on, not to really engage the brakes, will actually pump the pedal up and it'll give you a really nice firm brake pedal. And, uh, and that makes a difference. I mean, not only in how the brakes engage, but in driver confidence in, in engaging the brakes and all that. So um, 
definitely a great habit to be in, especially in some of your bigger break zones where maybe you use the exit curb off the previous corner. Um, don't need to do it all the way down the straightaway, but just before a break zone, great habit to get in. Just bring your left foot over, touch the brake once or twice, nice firm brake pedal. Yeah, and it's a, a bit of peace of mind. Number one, for those real high speed, long straightaways where you got a tight corner at the end, it's nice to know they're there. And and uh, absolutely, and I have found it all the way from Spec Miata up through when we ran MX-5 and into some other classes, especially when you use the curb getting on to the straightaway you, you've you know that little bit of bearing slop and you know er, everything that you know everything's moving just a tick right and uh and it just knocks that pads back a little bit and boy when you when you really need the brakes especially when you're drafting and you're all over the guy in front of you and his work a little bit better than you then you look like the idiot that ran into the back of the guy and it's and it's and it really wasn't you you tried you did everything right as a driver other than the the pads took a little bit longer to take up so i appreciate the question that's a great question. Yeah. Yep. The um, um, uh, anything else that you uh, that 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 you see here that um, that uh, kind of fits in with your driver coaching style when using data? Yeah, well, certainly. So there's there's a lot to be had. You know, when you're comparing data, whether you're using it against a pro, um, you know, that they run some laps in the car with you, or you have your teammates um, in focusing on the right things, right? Like j Roger, just like you mentioned, you know, focusing on the areas that are going to net you the most time. So if I was to just take a look, you know, at what's going on here, I would say, say if these were two different drivers and this was their best laps compared, right? Just for instance, right? Um, you could then say, oh, I see where I need to focus on. And you can go right to this, let's say this section from 6,000 feet in the track on to the, you know, to not necessarily the finish line, but all the way to about, you know, 8,500. And I need to work on that sector of the track. And so what this does, what this allows you to do is say, what I want to do the next session, my goal the next session is to really understand what do I need to do in this section of track to do a better job. And that should be the one goal for the session. It doesn't need to be, you know, oh, I need to pick up time here. I need to do this. I need to do that. Really allow your mind just to focus on maybe one, two things to, to extract some time. And then you can download data, do the overlay and see if you made an improvement. And before you do that, I would also probably check it against your previous run as the first look to see how much did you actually gain to yourself and then go ahead and put up the other reference, you know, to, 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 uh, to see what do you have left to make up. It, it's kind of funny that uh, Eric, uh, I, I, I got a note here to mention something about something you posted in the chat box a minute ago, but uh, that my eye went right there as well, Eric. The uh, we, the way that I do data, and I'm sure sure Tom as well, you, you scan it. And again, we're, we're making the assumption that it's two different drivers. It happens to be the same driver, but you, you scan all these things and you're looking for number one down here in the time compare bar, where were the big differences? That's the first thing. And Tom, you please, uh, in a moment, uh, I'll, I'll walk through kind of how I do it. And and then, uh, and then I look for just differences, right? And this, this first caught my eye because the speed channel is a money channel, right? And there's this big loss down here. There's the big, the red lap is substantially slower through this area. Then I would want to understand, and we're not going to go deep into this, but, but uh, it, it's interesting that they overslowed the red one for this section here and, and not quite with even as much break. Okay, uh, all of this is starting to, starting to feed together a little bit here, right? How, wh how and why did it slow down? Look at the, look at the RPM here. You know, mm, it, it looks like he dropped a gear, uh, maybe a downshift and let the engine slow it down. Okay, it, because the brakes aren't there, but it's slowing down that pulled RPM up. Okay, and then then uh, I seen the same thing that that Eric seen, which was what which was which was this big counter steer, right? The, the, that happened right here. One or the other. We're only looking at two laps, so I'm assuming the orange one is the uh, is the oddball. And uh, and you can see that. Uh, uh, and that may be wrong, but you can see all of a sudden the orange one kind of gets back up and, and, and holds his own the rest of the way. But after that little problem there, that might be a, a loose condition where they had to woe down the car. He had to hit the brakes even harder that second part of this, uh, the, 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 the back straightaway kind of chicane that they've got there at Portland. And, uh, and then, of course, there was a lot of steering to ca capture it. Uh, great eye, Eric. Those are the things, you, wh whether or not 
we're not going to answer that problem here, but I love that we just walked through this and we've seen it down here. We've seen it up here. We've seen it. Okay. Well, this is a little odd. And then boom, we start to focus in on what happened, where did it happen? The where is a big part of going to the next one, which is the, why did it happen? And then try to understand it. And then, um, and then move on to, to, to talking with you, you as your own driver or you, you, whoever you're coaching. It, how, do, how do you approach and, 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 and check out the bigger picture stuff and find things like that? Similar? Yeah, Roger. Yeah, absolutely similar. And, and so when it's, when you were not the driver and you say, Oh, I remember what happened, right? Yeah. If you, if I was like the coach and analyzing this, I tell you the piece that is going to be so, so worth it. I mean, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words is using that smarty cam and actually looking and saying, what happened here? Was the line different? You know, perhaps uh, you, you tried a different arc, you know, into the corner, you, you, you lined up on the break point a little bit differently. Um, if you have the video to help understand what what here and <laughs> that's why i love the smarty cam so much because i can just say oh yep what lap number okay i need to go to you know lap 24 and i need to or 12 i'm sorry i need to go there figure that out in in about a minute i can go exactly to this point and understand what's going on visually and that helps a lot of the drivers sometimes say yep I turned in a little differently or this or that. And the data obviously backs it up. You can look at it right there and see the, the, you know, the orange line turned more um, right where the cursor is right now. And it might've gotten the car in a, in a yaw sense that, you know, could have upset it. But again, you go back to the video and you can see that and it makes more sense typically for drivers that aren't so data savvy. Like we do, we have some really data savvy uh, yeah. folks here today, but, um, yeah. but that would, that would be where I would start. Video is super powerful. And you may not have played it much with it yet, Tom, but you know, our Race Studio 3 uh, analysis tool is now out in beta. I probably should have had it up here. We try to kind of run with the, with the standard stuff, the production stuff, but uh, beta in Race Studio 3, we would have these two laps and there would be video windows sitting right here. Wherever I put the cursor, the video jumps to it. And that makes that you were talking about, it only took you a minute. It would only take you about 10 seconds with the, with the new directly linked video um, uh, you know software that we're, we're running with now in race studio 3 beta so I can't uh, wait for that <laughs> exactly no as, as well as everybody else and it is uh, for those of many people are here watching uh, and and it is available just go to the aim aim sports website that that beta is available it's working pretty darn well on certain things it's the, not fully featured yet but it's uh, it, it has your basic you know video data integration it's got maps it's got uh, you know the, the basics right you know channels report uh, you know some some it, some simple things but uh, and Roger just real quickly on that because I don't I, you know I don't want to come up with the answer oh well you need video because that, that's not necessarily the case you've got you've invested in yeah, data we, we've seen it. What, yeah what 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 are we doing here and the thing is that you can see as you've been able to highlight um, with zooming in on the track map yeah look at the line yeah exactly the, you know yeah. and and it looks to me like the orange car might might have been able to take a little more curb, a lot more curb perhaps, and it really upset the car and it, and it, and it yawed the car quite a bit and the driver had to make a big correction um, because they might have taken too much curb and unweighted the car. So. Yeah, and, that, and that, that caught him up over here where he had to really catch it, and, but yet, and, and here's where that balance happens, right? And now yet his exit speed is, uh, is, is, is good, if not just a tick better, right? And, and certainly a little bit better farther up. So maybe there's a maybe there's a happy medium there that you would coach the driver to to, to maybe go halfway in between or something. Right. Perfect. Perfect. The uh, uh, I was actually going to talk to you about video, so I'm glad you, you brought that one up. Uh, let's do one more poll, kind of on the way out. We're kind of going to start closing this down. Let's lo let's launch this poll. What uh, again, helping us helping us understand where we want to go in the future. What uh, select the three topics you'd like to see in future aim aim sports stuff the uh, uh, of these webinars. The uh, while that's playing, I, I did want to cover one that I saw earlier. Eric mentioned in the in the chat box that he was uh, he enjoyed the suspension uh, analysis talk we had the other day and uh, and was hoping for a two hour part two. The, uh, the uh, maybe it won't be two hours, uh, Eric, to disappoint you a little bit, but we we certainly are uh, planning and trying to figure found find a spot to do a, a second um, 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 suspension analysis program. Uh, what I want to do is, is not just technically how the software works, which we talked a little bit about, but go a little bit deeper into that, but then bring in somebody that understands 
what the shock um, you know, from from the engineering standpoint and understands and, and help and help us look at some data and find data that had a a, a pre and a post adjustment and then look at the look at the software and understand and see the differences. So that's what I'm working on, Eric. Don't uh, 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 just so you know, we uh, we are we are we are continuing to work on that. It was uh, it, I I had more positive feedback from the suspension analysis than I thought I would. So so we are we are going to continue to to dig into that. Let's end that poll real quickly and share the results of what everybody uh, uh, wants to maybe see the uh, future topics. Uh, data analysis, everybody is still pumped about seeing uh, data analysis. This was multiple choice, so there's, uh, there's plenty of them. That, at six, seven, 69%, uh, the, the second place one there is, is a little bit more information on track maps. I've got some ideas on, uh, on digging a little bit deeper into that, especially on the, on the type uh, on the Ray Studio 3 of generating new track maps or editing track maps in, in Ray Studio 3, not necessarily on the uh, analysis side, but uh, that's the one area we haven't covered a, a ton so far. So that's uh, so, so certainly thinking about that. And then the, uh, the, the third place one was, uh, was uh, do, 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 uh, Smarty Cam setup. That's you know, the, we, we talked briefly about Smarty Cams early on and there's some videos on that, but we haven't done a ton on the setup side. So we might, uh, we, we might wanna chat about that. And then configurations and, and the rest of them are right in that same little area. So uh, we will continue to uh, continue to study study these results and continue to try to build uh, webinars that work for everybody. So I appreciate that. The uh, let me jump back to the uh, to the presentation. Um, are you working with auto syncing video and data, Scott? The uh, the Ray Studio three software is where we have done that, and it uh, and it uh, it is automated, and uh, it just you open up the window. As soon as you open up a data lap, the video opens and it is synced, you know, based on GPS uh, location and time, uh, exactly where you were in your data. So that uh, that is available to you. So uh, as of now, in in the in the beta software, but it is working pretty well. So. Uh, Tom, a little bit about what, what we're doing here, and uh, and, and then we'll, we'll kind of close this thing out a little bit. Uh, we we have um, uh, every one of these videos we do, and you know, right now we're up to this will be number 115 out on our YouTube site. Many of them, uh, I think we're you know, number 49 here today, right? Uh, so uh, all of the webinars within an hour or so of us finishing up, uh, this webinar will be up on the on the YouTube site. If you just go to AIM Data, youtube.com forward slash AIM Data, you'll find us. The links in all of your emails you get from us, and um, and uh, lots and lots of information there. Not just the the webinars we've done, but also previous. Um, de uh, previous uh, informational videos on how to do GPS lap insert and you know sorting channels and test properties and and all sorts of stuff that is still very very valid uh, very valid videos so take a look at the YouTube site and uh, and uh, and everything we do is up there so um, customer support uh, I am I am just pleased as punch I was able to to uh, go go and um, uh, go to my first racetrack uh, outside of my local area, but go to my first racetrack uh, this last weekend down at Laguna Seca with a Radical and, and a Porsche, Car Porsche Cup event and uh, really enjoyed myself. Got to talk with lots of folks. First time I've been out there with a lot of folks and uh, I'll bet you 50, 60% of the people that came up to me uh, had watched uh, some, if not all of the webinars, either live or, or on the uh, on, on YouTube. So it's, um, the, the webinars are getting out there, the information's out there. It's, it's kind of, kind of cool. So continue, uh, to give us a holler, look for us out at the track. Uh, we have, uh, our guys are traveling, uh, every, every weekend. We're out here somewhere, look for the big vans and, uh, or, uh, guys like me walking around with backpacks and, uh, and, and just checking in on everybody. It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty good at, what, uh, what we're able to do to help everybody out. So, um, Let's talk about the next webinar. We always try to announce the one, next one we're going to do, and, and, and this coming Thursday, September 17th, we're going to have a, a, another first-time host that's going to work with us, uh, Samir Abid from you, Your Data Driven. The, the, um, what, what Samir does is, is, he, is he takes different data sources, but uh, there, there's a bit of a focus on AIM, just because we're fairly popular. But uh, one of the things that I, I continue to get some emails about is, uh, hey, what about gear selection, right? Not 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 what gear ratio should you have in your transmission, but boy, we've all hit those corners where you're, you're racing through the corner and you go, well, I could go through that in the top of third or, or do I want to shift ahead of it and roll through it in fourth? You know, what is, what is the right speed? What is the best, where, where should I be on this? It's, it's, it's never easy, right? There's always corners where you're, you're, you're in between gear selections. And um, uh, Samir has come up with some, a process that uh, I, I belong to his, uh, 
email list and and he he had created a process that talks basically it's named remove all gear selection doubts and he called it the gear ratio map and he uses aim software aim data and uh, and he and he gives you some tips and tricks and tools to um to, to take a look at it and say, boy, should, should you be in, have been in second gear in this corner or third gear and, and what was the, the, the speed differential? And he has a, a nice little process to do that. So we're gonna, we're, we're gonna expose everybody to that uh, this coming Thursday. Uh, he's gonna be with us. We're gonna enjoy uh, taking a look at some data and, and, and also maybe talk a little bit about his website and some of the other things that he uses, uh, AIM data and, and has some processes around. So that, that will be a fun one in the next one. Hope to see everybody uh, show up and, and be with us there. So so that'll be fun. The, um, uh, to kind of close this one out, uh, Tom Long, I, I appreciate it. It's been great chatting with you again uh, as we kind of prepared for this. Uh, there's Tom's uh, contact information. Tom, um, Tom not only at, at TomLongRacing.com, he has, um, of, of course, his contact information and some, and some cool things on there, but he also writes a blog. And, uh, and I know Robbie has, uh, has already linked to it a couple of times. Maybe he'll do it one more time here at the end. But, uh, and in that, one of, one of the stories he, he, he blogged about and talked about was that point where you know, a month or two ago where he went down to South Carolina, I believe, right? Where, he, uh, where, he, where they did that uh, temperature testing and he, and he wrote a blog about it for even more information than what uh, Tom shared with us today. Maybe, maybe step over to his website and take a look. Tom, I appreciate all the hard work you put into this. It's uh, it's been fun chatting with you. It's I think there's been great value to to all the folks that are uh, here listening. Uh, anything else you'd like to kind of add as we uh, as we kind of close it up? Yeah, my pleasure, Roger. No, thanks for having me. Uh, it's just been uh, you know, it's it, as you said, we're always learning, we're always evolving, and uh, it's just so much fun to be able to 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 use data and, and all the assets you have to uh to become a better better driver better coach just uh, better all around in, in the sport so uh thanks again for having me and uh hope to see everybody out at the uh the racetrack soon absolutely and we'll we also will uh we'll say it now and we'll uh, we'll talk about it privately in the future we hope we can invite you back and ha and uh, and pick another topic and and uh and and do another one or two of these as we go through the winter as uh, as things slow down i know you've been super busy this compressed rate motorsports uh motorsports year it's been it's been crazy for folks and uh, having to adjust their schedule so i appreciate you taking the time uh everybody i uh, i appreciate everybody coming it's uh it's been great we look forward to seeing you everybody here on Thursday for the next one. Talk to you soon.